Good morning. It is Monday, September 12th. I'm Jessica Lovell. Welcome in. Well, Chiefs fans certainly having a happy start to the week. And as we come fresh out of the weekend, Dr. Dana Hawkinson is going to join us this morning with the latest COVID-19 numbers. Chronic back pain is a condition that affects millions of Americans. I couldn't stand for a half hour anymore. We'll introduce you to one of the biggest breakthroughs in chronic back pain treatment in the last 15 years. Plus, the parking lot between Arrowhead and Kauffman Stadium will soon turn into a black tie affair, all in the name of providing the most advanced cancer care in the region. Thank you for joining us here on Facebook, YouTube, and on Twitter this morning. We are live inside the Dolph C. Simons Jr. Family Broadcast Studio. Ron Verlin, the much-needed back pain to deal with his uh, back pain issues, the treatment came in something called Reactivate. We're going to share Ron's story and show you how it works. Ron's doctor is here with us in studio, Dr. Dawood Syed, Chief Division Chief of Pain Medicine at the Health System and Vice Chairman of the Board at the American Society of Pain and Neuroscience. So he knows his stuff. Good morning, how are you? Good morning, Jessica. Good, Thanks did you have a good weekend? Me. Yeah, it was great. Okay. We were just talking about, you know, good Chiefs game and uh, our, our Jayhawk football team did really well too. So. Yeah, so it's a happy Monday. And great weather. So. Absolutely, fall is here. Well, as always, please send in your questions using your chat thread or your email. The links to all of those are right there on your screen. 65 million Americans say they have suffered some sort of back pain over the last year. That's according to the Health Policy Institute. In fact, back pain is the sixth most costly condition in the United States, including the price of time away from work. Finding effective pain relief without drugs is always the goal. And as Bob Hallinan shows us, Ron Verlin is, has now found it. Ron Verlin likes to relax by plucking out some tunes on his bass guitar. He doesn't even need an amp. But back in the day, he sounded more like this. That's Ron sitting on the box, surrounded by his group Shooting Star and the five CDs they made back in the early 80s. What started as the ultimate garage band in Overland Park with some high school friends turned into a full-blown music career. It took them from sock hops and frat parties around town to touring the U.S. and Europe. We ended up getting to go to London again and record our first album with Gus Dudgeon, who was Elton John's producer. Ron eventually left the band for a more traditional career in finance. He retired three years ago but a condition called spinal stenosis was keeping him from fully enjoying life. I couldn't stand for a half hour anymore. It was altering my lifestyle some. The often excruciating back pain even kept him from taking walks. That's when he found out about a new device called Reactive 8 from his doctor at the University of Kansas Health System. The device is implanted near the spine with a couple of wires on either side. Ron just pushes a few buttons on a remote holds it to his back, and the pain relief begins. It's like a little massage kind of feeling. It's electrical, but it doesn't hurt. He says life is so much better now, he's even able to take long walks again. And he's looking forward to a relaxing vacation with his wife. Once we did the implant, I used it like three or four days, and that pain just went away, and it's never come back again. Dr. Syed working on our local rock star. Right. Yeah, I love I love seeing these stories. because I learned stuff about my patients that I didn't know. I had, right? no, I had no idea. I knew that he was into music, but I didn't know that he had, you know, quite a decorated music. Career. Yeah, you know, right. His, See, his learning CDs and touring and all these. Types yeah, of learning stuff. right along along with us this morning. So how's Ron doing today as a patient? Yeah, uh, I think his music career is kind of on the on the downside. But as a patient for his back, he's doing, you know, wonderfully. You know, he's been one of the patients that um, like when we st- you know, did in the study, you know, over five years ago, he, he looked just like those patients that we kind of selected for that. So he was one of the earliest patients that we treated here at the University of Kansas Health System. Uh, and he's about a year out now since from the therapy. And he's almost essentially pain free from his back pain. I think he, you know, he, he reports anywhere from 80 to 90% reduction in his pain for no, which, no pun intended, like music to his ears, like in real life. Right? Absol- no absolutely. Pain. Absolutely. You know, he's, he's really not talking about his back a- anymore, really. So, um, so it's really kind of what we 
we want people to do. We want people to really, you know, get to the point where their issues with the dysfunction in their back is really not, you know, anything that they really think about anymore. And that's really how Ron is. Um, one kind of point of clarification, you know, I saw earlier in the segment that it said this was for spinal stenosis. It's actually not for spinal stenosis. This device that Ron had, and we have a lot of great therapies for spinal stenosis, just does, does not happen to be one of them, um, is for, you know, dysfunction of the main stabilizer of the back. That muscle's called the multifidus muscle. And most people, this is the muscle that when you go to physical therapy, when you have back issues, this is the muscle that the physical therapist is trying to get to start working normally again. This is where usually where the, all the problems start. Patients potentially may have had an injury to their back or a degenerative disc, and then this muscle starts to work in an abnormal fashion. And it's the main way that stabilizes your spine. So over time, as that muscle's not working properly, uh, these patients can have you know, debilitating pain because of the instability. So what we do with the device that Ron had is that we actually kind of hijack that system that's kind of gone haywire, uh, and we actually implant these small electrodes on the uh, nerve that goes to that muscle in the lower back, that multifidus okay. muscle, and it actually restores that muscle and gets it to work uh, in a proper fashion. So these patients get, you know, uh, these stimulation set, uh, sessions, uh, so for about 60 minutes a day, 30 minutes in the morning, usually in 30 minutes at night before they go to bed, this device will turn on and start to activate these muscles and strengthen them, almost giving it kind of an internal exercise, almost implanted physical therapy, as I tell my patients. That's really helpful to see the inside of a exactly what's going on and where that where that is shooting to and how how it's making its way to the specific places there in in the back uh, i have some other questions but while we're talking about spinal stenosis and i'm sure that question is going to come up with our viewers exactly what is that and and who does that affect spinal stenosis is again another very common kind of pathology or a problem that people develop in their lower back or spine Essentially, what spinal stenosis is, uh, is essentially a narrowing of the elements inside the spinal canal. So again, all of us have, you know, our spine that kind of starts from the, you know, bottom of our skull all the way down to our tailbone, and inside that are the nerves and the discs and all those kind of things. In certain people, uh, if that internal canal uh, starts to narrow uh, and, and get smaller and put a pinch on the nerves in the lower back, they develop something called spinal stenosis. And typically, patients with that type of uh, issue will have, you know, aching and pain in their lower back and legs when they try to walk or ambulate or stand and typically those symptoms will kind of go away if they're kind of sitting there uh, but you know for for this uh, device in particular uh, it's really not for spinal stenosis some patients can have some spinal stenosis and benefit from this but this is really not the typical indication for it so we saw Ron in the video just hitting a button like a remote control tell us exactly what's happening every time he touches that button yeah, so after the patients are implanted with a small kind of micro device that's kind of done on an outpatient basis, they'll go home with the device and it's all programmed for them. So again, we tell them to find kind of a, you know, a quiet area, area where they can kind of uh, rest comfortably, usually on their bed, uh, and they'll initiate a session. And what this session does is kind of almost like patients will describe it kind of as like a small little back massage mm -hmm. um, as, as what the patient really feels. But what actually is what's happening is that uh, those little electrode, that device is actually activating that muscle in the lower back mm -hmm. and, and, and pulsing it, pulsing it over 30 minutes. Uh, and it's just like any muscle you can, uh, you know, exercise, you know, think about when you're doing um, push-ups or something like that. Um, so this is kind of doing push-ups in the back. And then over time, you know, that muscle is going to get stronger. And we think that muscle is very important. We know that muscle is very important to the overall stability uh, of the lower back. So once that muscle is strong enough, uh, their back goes from an instable area where they're causing a lot of issues when they're moving and having activity to an issue where that muscle is nice and strong and it's stable, that core is really strong and they can go about their normal activities with really minimal to no pain. So it's not, in, they have to go somewhere and sit down and do it like a treatment. It's, it's like a 30-minute treatment. treatment. But I was thinking you wouldn't feel it, but you actually do feel some sort of movement in there. Yeah. Something's happening. Yeah, people know it's on, you, mm -hmm. know, you know, and uh, so part of it is, you know, trying to figure out what's that comfortable spot over the first few months as well, too. You know, patients will come back and say, wow, I kind of feel it too much. That's that's pretty, that's, it's pretty intense. So we'll, we'll have to go in there, recalibrate the device and make sure it's at a point where, you know, it's just kind of, uh, it should be more of a, 
a pleasant kind of experience for them. It shouldn't be irritating. If it's kind of they come back and say that's pretty, it's pretty intense. And it's again, I can make a an analogy to like a massage. You go in for a massage and you're just pushing on it too hard. You know, there's that sweet spot that we oh, try yeah. to find for them where it's you know it's the good amount of pressure. Uh, so they kind of find that sweet spot over. Usually, it doesn't take very long to find that the calibration of the device is really straightforward. We do it here in the office, um, just kind of with a little external programmer that kind of communicates with it, kind of like through a. a, a Palm Pilot. Wow, that's really or a uh, or, Palm you know, Pilot. Or a Palm Pilot. That's going or, back a few years. <laughs> Palm, I saw the CDs. Now I'm like going back in time. Right. Um, uh, but like through a tablet or something like that. So uh, it's all wireless and uh, really easy to do. All right. I want to share a quote with you. Um, there's uh, this comes from a doctor out of Jefferson City. He is a spinal surgeon, and this is what he had to say about the reactivate treatment. He says, there's a big obvious emphasis on the opioid epidemic. So we know that those medications are harmful and they're actually relatively in ineffective anyway. And so this is the first of its kind technology to be able to treat those patients. Do you agree? Yeah, I mean, I totally, we all know that the opioid epidemic has been something that's been essentially a catastrophic thing for, you know, our country and even across the world now we're seeing, you know, uh, the rising uh, levels of opioid overdoses and people kind of transitioning from the opioids that they were able to get, you know, in their doctor's office. And, you know, now that that spigot's been kind of turned off, you know, we all know it in the medical community is probably not the best thing to do. Unfortunately, some of these patients have become addicted or dependent, have gone to the streets uh, yeah. for opioids. And now we see the illicit overdose uh, death you know, it's continuing to rise and kind of stay at a pretty high level. It's pretty scary for all of us to see. So why we think, you know, this device is really important to kind of combat the opioid epidemic is that, you know, this is kind of not like an issue, you know, the first disease we talked about a little bit, spinal stenosis. Oftentimes there's a surgery or a fix for that. Uh, for this type of issue, you know, when your muscles are just not working properly, mm -hmm. you can go to the best spine surgeon at, at the University of Kansas or New York City or whatever. When they see this problem, most of our colleagues in spine will say, you know, there's really not an operation for this. Your muscles just need to be stronger. Mm -hmm. And, you know, patients will try physical therapy. For some people, it's just the problem is too far gone. You know, yeah. uh, they've had too much, you know, too many years of back pain, that physical therapy that they've tried it, it doesn't work. So this is a nice option for patients that have really been told that there's really nothing else that they can do for their uh, mm -hmm. for their back issues besides you know exercise uh, and we know when people are at a pretty high level of pain and disability and dysfunction exercise and physical therapy can only get them so far so this is really a nice option unfortunately what's happened you know patients in the past where they've been told you know there's no fix for this really the only thing you can do is manage your pain they get a prescription for pain medications that's a problem so we can, a, we, we, can, we can offer them something different have you been able to get people off i mean have you seen these successful stories where somebody came with a, an addiction that wanted help to get off of this yeah you know i and i don't think ron really fit this bill he right. wasn't really on a lot of pain medications to start with he was one of those kind of stoic guys that was just <laughs> taking over the counters and things like that but yeah the great majority of patients that you know we implant with this type of device are going to reduce their ma pain medication usage significantly if not completely eliminate them so so, you know, again, it just depends kind of what's the deal, what's their issue for their pain. If their pain and why they're on pain medication is for their lower back, when you can reduce their pain uh, in their lower back by, you know, 70 to 80 to 90 percent, that's the difference between, you know, having to take something like a powerful opioid for your pain to just maybe taking a Tylenol once or twice a week, which is, you know, reasonable for most people. I love and, what you said about Ron when you said he just doesn't talk about his back pain anymore because I would imagine for your patients, this just rules their life. This is what they wake up talking about, what they talk about all day and go to bed with it and wake up again. So nice to hear. I want to talk to you about the maker of Reactivate System. It's called Mainstay Medical Holdings, and they released some data two years ago. It found that 71% of people who got the Reactivate implant reduced their back pain by more than 50% after two years. And when it came to reducing or quitting opioid use, Reactivate appeared to have a huge impact after those two years, with about 60% of those Reactivate patients feeling the, uh, feeling the difference. And, you know, just kind of reiterate, are you seeing those similar results? Yeah, I mean, I think the nice thing with this therapy is that, you know, uh, we were actually one of the clinical sites in that trial. Mm -hmm. So it was a kind of a international clinical study with over 30 sites, you know, in one of the largest studies for, you know, lower back pain in, in using this device that, that had ever been done. Uh, and it was a really highly, you know, rigorous, you know, scientific study where patients actually got the device 
uh, and half of the patients actually got the device in a placebo mode, and the other half got the device how it's actually supposed to be uh, delivering the therapy. So, you know, in a clinical study, we can kind of do those types of things to yeah. really actually see how effective it is, because we know sometimes, you know, there is a placebo response, and, you know, anything you do, you can give someone kind of a, a sugar pill or something like that, you can sometimes see an effect. Uh, so in a clinical study, when you actually kind of put in uh, the device in two populations of patients and actually don't really turn it on in one side and actually turn it on, you can see what the actual effect is. So that's why those results were really exciting when we saw that on the initial uh, on the initial follow-up, you know, that these patients were really responding very well. Uh, you know, we've been able to kind of track these patients now out to five years and we see that uh, the, the interesting thing about this, you know, a lot of the things that we do when we treat patients with pain, uh, they work really well sometimes at first and then there's kind of a waning effect. You know, maybe it doesn't work as well after two or three or four or five years just because the problems may be getting worse, the patient's getting a little bit older. Mm -hmm. But with this uh, clinical study, it's kind of first time I've seen in my career where the actual uh, results in the patients has actually improved every year we've looked at the patient set. So they actually, this two-year data, the three-year data is re going to be recent, uh, being is, is in the process of being published uh, in the next few weeks. Actually, the patients are doing even better. You know, they're about 10 to 15 percent better. And we think part of that is because of the way this therapy works is actually not just uh, you know okay kind of a palliative treatment where it's just taking pain away it's actually getting the patients better it's getting that muscle stronger so over time just like with any muscle when you exercise when you get on your your, your treadmill if you you know use it consistently you get faster you get better at it so the same thing with this that muscle continues to get better stronger uh, so these patients actually are doing better over time so which not, is nice to see not just throwing a band-aid over it exactly we are getting some great community questions we are going to get to those in just a moment but let's get with uh, dr. Hawkinson how are you this morning I, are you you're happy with your sports over the weekend your KU Chiefs yeah, yeah absolutely it was good you good, know, good good win for the Jayhawks they definitely need it so good good all right yeah. well give us the COVID count yeah well right now we have 26 active infections in the hospital uh, five in the ICU three on the ventilator 15 that recovery period uh, we're gonna deep dive into some of those uh, active infections and just look and see and Hopefully we can resolve some of their active flags because they may have been here a little bit. So we'll have better, uh, more up-to-date numbers tomorrow and in the rest of the week as well. So. All right. Well, new overnight, the state of New York declared an emergency after finding more mm -hmm. spread of polio virus. So how, you know, yeah. how, when we hear something like that, it feels far away, but is it possible it could come here mm -hmm. to the Midwest? Yeah, I absolutely think it does. I mean, this is certainly my opinion, but with all of the um, international travel and people coming in from all over the world, we know and understand that most of the world still uses the oral polio uh, vaccine, which can uh, induce live replicating virus. I think if we looked for it in our uh, wastewater around the Midwest, I'm, I'm sure we would find it. Again, that's just my opinion, but I think it is extremely important to continue to understand that because of this, it is so vitally important that you are up to date with your vaccinations and especially your children. And please talk with your pediatricians to get them up to date and get them vaccinated. Hawk, a, a new study published in Time finds you can still get long COVID if you're vaccinated mm -hmm. or boosted. We know yeah. that the shots and booster, as you have said, help keep us out of the hospital and with severe disease. So, yeah. but we, we're still telling everyone get that shot, right? Yeah, you know, I haven't seen the Time article, obviously, but certainly we know that other peer-reviewed medical publications certainly support the fact that if you are up to date with your vaccination, if you're just vaccinated, if you're boosted, you are going to have a reduced risk of long COVID. Again, nothing is really absolute, but we know that the vaccines continue to provide reduced risk of uh, long COVID. So I think, yeah, that is one of the reasons why we still do encourage people to get vaccination. Um, you're risk is going to go down. You can still get some of those complications, uh, but overall it's going to be much improved compared to if you don't have the vaccine. All right, uh, clear this one up. Studies say vitamin D won't protect you from COVID or respiratory infections, but what we know that it does help with other infections. How? Oh, no. I don't think it does. I think, you know, it, it doesn't work. People have been looking at this, uh, the vitamins, different vitamins uh, for many different things. Uh, these do not protect you from infection. They don't pr protect you from, uh, from the complications of those infections. So, 
You know, I think there's uh, very good data to support the fact that some of these, although we'd like them to because they're cheap and they're readily accessible, they unfortunately just don't provide the protection that is needed, um, nor are they used as treatment for respiratory infections, and particularly SARS-CoV-2 as well. All right. Thanks for clearing yeah. that up. Yeah. Uh, we've got some questions for you, so hang tight. We'll be back in just a moment. Do we have any reporter questions on the line today? All right, well, we are gonna get to our community as we like to do. Let me pull those questions up. Kim wants to know, wondering if this device would help with scar tissue from open splenectomy. Splenectomy, splenectomy? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, you know, I, I can't answer, you know, if it would work for this and if this uh, uh, individual had low back pain that was associated with this possibly, but it sounds like, you know, from an open incision from the splenectomy, and I'm not a general surgeon, I don't do spleen surgery, uh, but from I know from the anatomy, they probably have to go in from the front side. So usually uh, yeah, we do see patients that develop chronic pain syndromes from these anterior surgeries. Uh, we have quite a few other types of options for this, but this device in particular that we talk, we're talking about would not really be a good solution for that type of pain. Angela wants to know, can this be implanted for neck pain if it's a little bit higher up in the back and not lower? Yeah, that's another really good question. I think, you know, we're, we're starting to evaluate some of the stabilizing muscles in the mid part of the back and the neck and see how they're implicated. Uh, currently, right now, this device is only cleared for patients with lower back issues. Okay, and uh, April wants to know, she does suffer lower back pain, a little concerned about having something implanted. So can you just help kind of paint that picture of what it looks like, where it is, how it feels, what is the process of actually getting it inside your body? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a really, you know, important question for people because it's a little bit different than, you know, uh, having an injection or having, mm -hmm. uh, you know, taking a, a medication. This is something that is a, a medical device, similar to like a pacemaker, would probably be the closest thing that people maybe have some familiar Popularity with. Um, so again, there's uh, two parts to the system. The first part uh, are these small little electrodes or wires that are implanted act, uh, on, the, on the muscle or the nerve that innervates that in the lower back. And those are pretty low profile. They're really uh, maybe just a little bit thicker than dental floss. So most patients don't even realize that that part's in their body. The part that has a little bit more size to it is actually the part that powers those wires. And that's the, uh, the battery or the uh, internal pulse generator is what we call it. And that's usually probably about the size of a credit card maybe the size of about three credit cards stacked on top of each other. Uh, usually we find, you know, the layer kind of underneath the skin uh, in the subcutaneous tissues in the lower part of the back or in the side of part of the back, and we implant it in that area. Typically, patients won't really notice or realize that the implant's there. We usually can find a comfortable spot for, for most people. Uh, but there are some situations where, say, a patient's really, really thin, uh, where we have to kind of get a little bit creative on where we're going to put it. The technology on these devices continues to advance, so, you know, the first in, you know, generations of these similar types of implants were a lot larger than the footprint of the devices that we're putting in now. And I can kind of uh, confidently say that, you know, the devices coming, you know, uh, in the next one to three years will be even smaller, potentially not even be implanted in the body, maybe powered by an external source. Doctor, who makes a good patient for this versus somebody who might just need an injection? And why would it work for someone like Ron and maybe not another patient of yours? Yeah, so um, that's probably the, the the trickiest part for patients to kind of try to figure out and us as clinicians, who is the best candidate for this. What we found is, you know, uh, typically patients, first of all, have had to have, you know, tried, you know, conservative uh, therapies first, you know. So again, this is really not for someone with just a few months of back pain and they really haven't tried anything. So usually patients have had to have had uh, physical therapy, maybe tried injections and those types of things first and not gotten the results they wanted. We know that where it doesn't work too from the clinical study. So when a patient does have, you know, say a herniated disc in their back, say they have more leg pain than back pain, mm -hmm. that's probably not a great candidate for this. Really, the patients that do the best for this are patients that have kind of degenerative changes in their lower back and most of their pain is localized kind of in that lower back area. Answer this one for Mona. Can this help older people with scoliosis? Yeah, I mean, uh, it definitely can help, you know, patients uh, that have scoliosis. It's really not going to do anything for the scoliosis, but what we find is people that live with those types of conditions uh, for a long time, they can develop 
dysfunction in those back muscles. So uh, if the patient has, you know, no really, uh, you know, high grade, you know, n narrowing or pinching of the nerves due to this, the scoliosis or the curvature, um, then potentially this, this could be an option. Again, scoliosis, you know, uh, is, is defined as, you know, uh, abnormal curvature to the spine. So there are surgical solutions for that, depending on how severe it is. So we also have, you know, our, our, our orthopedic spine uh, surgery colleagues that are really good at addressing those types of issues as well. You mentioned earlier, this is not for spinal stenosis, but Juan wants to know, are there signs or symptoms of spinal st stenosis that somebody should look out for? Yeah, you know, I think um, spinal stenosis is one of those uh, issues that if most people over the age of, you know, say 65 get an MRI, we're going to find a little bit of spinal stenosis. Spinal stenosis essentially just means a narrowing, and we all kind of start to develop a, some narrowing in their spine over time. Uh, so again, the symptoms of that will be much different than, you know, the patient that has this back dysfunction. So again, spinal stenosis will typically be characterized by a patient that gets worse when they walk or stand, and typically they're going to present with achiness and pain in the legs. That's going to be, re re that's going to resolve when they sit back down. So that's that's really kind of the characteristics of uh, spinal stenosis. Another kind of characteristic sign uh, we, we've termed is called the shopping cart sign. Mm -hmm. So if someone goes to the grocery store and the first thing they want to do is grab a shopping cart and lean on it mm -hmm. and walk, uh, that's also kind of a characteristic sign of spinal stenosis. You know, I can go to the grocery store with my wife and say, that patient has spinal stenosis, and so does that one, because I can just see that they're leaning forward on that shopping cart to walk. And why, what, why that is kind of something that, you know, we know happens is a patient not even, maybe not be aware that when you bend forward and lean, you actually, you, you relieve the pinch in the spine. It opens up that canal, it opens up the dimension, so people can usually walk. Same way why people can walk better with a walker. Right. Uh, so that's one kind of sign. So if people say, hey, when I go to the... Uh, the grocery store, I just want that shopping cart and then I can walk forever. That's a symptom of spinal stenosis. Yeah, you probably have to ask that sometimes. Hey, by the way, do you lean over when you're shopping? You it's know. part of our questionnaire. Yeah, sure. right. Very technical. Uh, Yan Liang has a couple of questions. Um, how expensive is this? Yeah, How's I mean, it paid for? Sure. Um, you know, as far as, you know, the, the direct costs, you know, there's the cost of the implant and the surgery and those types of things. Um, this is uh, FDA approved and covered by, you know, most health plans now. So uh, patients, you know, out-of-pocket costs are pretty minimal. You know, it's covered uh, for our seniors in the Medicare program as well. So I, I can't give you the exact dollar amount. I know that, you know, it's pretty much widely available for most patients, you know, that have, you know, uh, health insurance and usually health insurance will cover it if they've met, met the medical criteria. I've got a couple more quick questions. Keith just jumped on. He says, can this be used on patients who have had scoliosis surgery? You, you mentioned scoliosis earlier. Short answer for that? Probably not. Not. Okay. Yep. And again, uh, this is probably some, we're trying to um, do this type of procedure earlier on in the course of patient's care. So typically patients, you know, we really want them not to have had, you know, a major spine operation and those types of things as well, because those muscles may have been stripped or removed during that surgery. Mm -hmm. And those are the muscles we're trying to restore. So oftentimes when patients have, you know, say, uh, you know, a lower back surgery, those muscles are kind of taken out to put in the hardware and the screws, et cetera. So you can't really restore muscles if they're not there. Kathy wants to know, is pain enough for a diagnosis or do you need a, some sort of test or x-ray? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. So pain is obviously what we're looking for. We're looking for patients with, you know, uh, significant lower back pain that in, inhibits their, you know, quality of life. But there are some things that we look for on the MRI. Uh, so on the MRI, I don't know if we can pull Ron's up or not, but there's these, we look at those muscles and what we you can see in patients uh, is that that muscle in the back has started to atrophy. You can see a thinning. You can actually see the muscle be replaced by fat. So again, I don't know if anyone's into like, you know, high grade, you know, steaks, you know, when you see that marbling in a mm -hmm. steak, that's kind of what can happen with patients that develop this pain. Uh, marbling, really good for the steak you eat at the fancy steakhouse, mm -hmm. really bad for your back. Uh, again, you want it to be mostly muscle. So when patients, when we look at that MRI and we see a lot of marbling in that muscle, we see it being the muscle being replaced by fat. That's a sign. That's a, that's a, a, a MRI finding of this multifidus atrophy. There's also some exam maneuvers, some things that we can pick up when we do a physical examination on the patient mm -hmm. uh, that also uh, show that they have dysfunction of those muscles. So usually a combination of, you know, their clinical history, what they've tried, what we see on the MRI, do we see kind of that dysfunction or that, you know, that, uh, that atrophy or weakening of that muscle on the MRI, and then some physical exam uh, findings. 
those kind of uh, lead us to kind of say this is the right therapy for that patient. That's why we love you. You can always describe things so we can understand. You're talking about shopping carts and steak and <laughs> layman's terms. You that's put what in I, layman's terms. That's what we love. Although okay. I did say Palm Pilot earlier. Though. You did. <laughs> I got that too, sadly. Uh, okay. Last question, though, uh, from Yen Liang is, do you have to try other procedures and treatments? Is it, do you have to be kind of in your worst case scenario to be able to have this treatment or is this a first line of defense? I think this is something that we're going to probably be doing earlier on. So again, uh, you know, I've been on here and we've talked about, you know, the conventional spinal cord stimulators. Uh, those are ones that we kind of implant in the spinal cord itself and not on the muscle. And those patients typically have all have tried everything. You know, they tried back surgery and they've had injections, they've been on medications, et cetera. This is something that we're probably going to do earlier on. So again, this is probably something that is done, you know, not before everything's been tried, but maybe a few things have been tried. Say the patient's had physical therapy uh, and they've done, you know, chiropractic care and those types of things, conservative things. Uh, then I think this is probably going to be in that middle zone. So not really at the end of the line, but maybe in the middle of the line, a little bit earlier in the, we say, the treatment algorithm for low back. Great stuff. Kathy, Joelle, and Jean, I'm going to promise you we will get to your COVID questions tomorrow. Dr. Hawkinson, you have my word. I'm going to ask you their great questions tomorrow because we're going to wrap up. Dr. Syed, always great to have you on. Uh, final thoughts today. Uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to do this this month is that September is uh, pain awareness month. We know that, you know, over 100 million people in the United States alone suffer from, you know, severe chronic debilitating pain. And we also know from the numbers that, you know, over 50 to 60 percent of that is coming from the lower back. So, you know, there's so much new technology and uh, therapies available that, you know, I don't think people really need to think that this is, you know, uh, this is their destiny to kind of live in this chronic pain forever or have these back issues and this is just how it is. You know, I think get, uh, talk to your primary care doctor, say, hey, can I see a spine specialist uh, to see if there's anything new and available. Maybe you went, you know, uh, a few years ago and all they offered you were injections. I can tell you that, you know, things change uh, really on a quarterly or a year to year basis. You know, we just got this great tool in our, in our toolbox for these patients, you know, just a year ago. So uh, I think continue to kind of, you know, not give up or if you have a loved one uh, that you just kind of see suffering. That's how Ron kind of came in. Ron actually uh, has a, uh, a spouse that works here in the health system mm -hmm. and, and she saw one of the, the stories that we did on it earlier on during the clinical study and uh, and said would we evaluate her husband and I looked at he came in and I was like he's perfect for this you know so uh, you never know so just continue to kind of uh, be a, a good ambassadors for yourself and for your your family members uh, and if you're a physician out there your patients. You don't have to live in pain. Doc thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Appreciate you. Dr. Hawkinson, yeah. final thoughts today. Yeah, I mean, hope everybody had a, a good start to the week uh, yesterday with the Chiefs win. And um, it's an, it was a nice day, so hopefully everybody got out and was active as well. And we'll keep uh, you know, a, a running tab on how we're doing with the infections. I think overall cases are going down. Remember, boosters uh, will be out soon if you haven't had COVID-19 recently. It's, a, it's good to go ahead and get your boosters. We will be getting our first doses at the ho uh, health system here probably on uh, September 14th. That's the plan, so we'll be ready at that point. Thanks so much. Treads and Threads is back and in person this weekend, but with a big change. It will be held in the parking lot between Arrowhead and Kauffman Stadium. The 20th annual Treads and Threads event to help raise money to support proton therapy gets underway Saturday night. In addition to some of the best food in KC, some cool cars, 100 healthcare workers will also get a chance to enjoy the night for all their work during the pandemic. Also returning is everyone's favorite entertainment, Emerald City Band. Hey everybody, it's Dino with the Emerald City. And I can't believe it, but this is the 20th anniversary for Treads and Threads. And you know this calls for one huge celebration. And we are so pumped to be coming back to Kansas City live, in person, for what we consider our favorite gig of the year. And I can't wait to see you. I've met so many of you, so many friends. We're going to be at the Truman Sports Complex. Make sure you bring those comfortable shoes, get ready to party, because we are going to be celebrating with a purpose. Congratulations, by the way, on the success of great fundraising to create the new Proton Therapy Center and to help cancer patients at the University of Kansas Health System. Again, remember, September 17th, put it down in your book. I'm going to see you there. Emerald City, Treads and Threads, we are going to party with a purpose. I'll see you then. 
Those guys are always a good time. They make a, they make for a late night for those party goers, for sure. Well, speaking of singers, one of our very own breast cancer experts is belting it out and sharing her voice for a cause she is very passionate about. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave. Wow. That is Division Chief of Breast Surgical Oncology at the Cancer Center. And, of course, a frequent morning medical update guest, Dr. Jamie Wagner. Wow. She sang the national anthem during Friday night's game, which was also Breast Cancer Awareness Night at the K. Fans had a chance to get more information on things like the importance of 3D mammograms and the importance of receiving treatment from an NCI comprehensive center like ours. Reaching comprehensive status as an NCI designated cancer center is really saying that we are the best of the best in this country. The University of Kansas Cancer Center is only one of 53 NCI-designated comprehensive cancer centers in the country, and that is the highest honor bestowed by the NCI. The first Breast Cancer Awareness Night at the K was held last September. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. Have a great one, and we'll see you back here tomorrow at 8. Coming up tomorrow on the Morning Medical Update. Learning you have stage 4 lymphoma is devastating. We've had a good life, and I'm just got a lot of living to do yet. And a bone marrow transplant is making all of that possible. We talk with him and his care team about why this option was the right choice. Tuesday at 8. Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stein's podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available.